You're listening to a Frequency Podcast Network production. There are a bunch of problems with the way we recycle in this country. If you've ever stared at some complicated piece of packaging and wondered if it goes in the bin, you understand a bit about them. However, trying to recycle packaging is better than just tossing it in a landfill, so we keep trying. The latest attempt to improve our recycling efforts is a changing of responsibilities. It's a way, in theory, to take the cost and the burden off of our cities and to handle the waste the way one would give tidying instructions to a toddler. You made the mess, you clean it up. That is the heart of extended producer responsibility. It means that the companies that create the packaging are now charged with picking it up and recycling it. This is in use across the country to a limited extent. Now Ontario is moving all of its recycling to this model, and it's doing it quickly. It's a major test of the concept, and there is a lot here to be tested. Do we trust for-profit companies to do a good job cleaning up after themselves? Will moving the onus to producers really encourage them to find ways to innovate or cut down their waste? And do we want those corporations to be the ones providing municipal services, or do we want our elected officials to at least be responsible and accessible when things inevitably go wrong? And finally, do we uh, have any evidence that this works? I'm Jordan Heath-Rawlings. This is The Big Story. Calvin Lacken is the co-investigator of the Waste Wiki Project at York University's Faculty of Environment and Urban Change. This is a research project devoted to advancing understanding of waste management research and policy in Canada. Uh, That sounds fascinating, Calvin. (laughs) It's Waste is a fun thing to be a part of. I want to ask you first because this will kind of set the tone for what we're going to discuss. In the world of waste management, uh, there are many different systems for managing it, but what is the extended producer responsibility system? So extended producer responsibility, in, in its simplest definition, means that the manufacturer producer of a product is physically and financially responsible for its management at its end of life. So essentially, uh, once it's ready to be landfilled, they have to find a way to keep it out of a landfill, either by contracting uh, municipal collection or engaging in collection themselves. Where does this currently happen in Canada and what products does it currently happen with? So we actually have extended producer responsibility schemes across all Canadian provinces and territories for different product categories. For waste electronics and hazardous waste, you'll have EPR programs in every single province and territory. What's been a relatively recent phenomenon is the transition of printed paper and packaging to an extended producer responsibility system. With that, uh, Quebec, Ontario, BC, and Manitoba have had forms of EPR uh, for the better part of two decades. However, more recently, you have the Prairie provinces and some of the Atlantic provinces that have adopted EPR legislation. And in addition to that, you have Ontario transitioning to something called full producer responsibility. So there's a lot of nuance to what EPR can look like and what it applies to, um, but it's definitely gaining significant momentum across Canada. What does it look like in practice? Because you say the producer is responsible for uh, managing the waste all the way to the end of the line, but obviously like Duracell's not coming around picking up batteries and uh, likewise with Pepsi and cans, right? Precisely. And so uh, in many instances, uh, producers band together to form what we call an industry funded organization or essentially just an uh, entity that represents the interests of producers and helps them coordinate their waste management responsibilities. So this can take many forms, once again, depending on whether it's partial EPR, full EPR, whether it's full 100% producer controlled. But in its simplest way, what will happen, at least for printed paper and packaging, which is a bit easier to conceptualize for most Canadians, you know, with our blue box system, municipalities will be absolved of, once again, that physical and financial responsibility for being responsible for this waste. However, producers who are now bear the onus of that responsibility may still continue to use municipalities for the purposes of blue bin collection. Alternatively, they can choose to go with a private contractor 
But essentially, the whole idea is that residents must maintain the same level of service, whereas an EPR system, it just allows more actors and players to be involved. And so you might have many different configurations depending on the locality, but essentially producers are calling the shots. What are the pros and cons of that system? And what do we know about how well it works? I'm sure I'm not the only person right now thinking about uh, municipalities handing over services to for-profit companies and how well that uh, has and hasn't worked in the past. So, you know, there's many ways to answer this question. And I think for the purposes of brevity, I'll say that there have been enormous challenges with the transition to extended producer responsibility, precisely for the reason you just alluded to, is that, you know, municipalities are handing over something to producers and producers fundamentally are not waste service providers. Right. So there's a lot of administrative complexity that's involved. And then a lot of things kind of fall through the floor because it's difficult to coordinate the multiple actions and interests of producers that are producing a very varied waste stream, but it's still being consolidated in a single bin by residents, which is then historically, like I said, picked up by municipal collection. So the whole idea is that EPR will help shift that responsibility away from municipalities, help shift the tax burden away from the municipalities onto producers, and really help design a system that is more receptive to recyclability because if producers are faced with a financial onus of being responsible for the system, they'll have greater incentives to find efficiencies and improve collection and essentially optimize the waste management system because they're the ones with the ultimate control over it. But in reality, because there's so many different players and actors and the difficulty in coordination and the uh, what we characterize as administrative externalities amongst all the various stakeholders, what we have is kind of patchwork systems that vary from jurisdiction to jurisdiction. And the efficacy of EPR has been questionable, at least if you define the success of a system in terms of increased recycling rates or decreased recycling system costs. When you say the blue box system is really complex and things can fall through the cracks, how complex is it? I don't know if most people understand exactly uh, what goes on behind the scenes and how well does it work uh, in practice in general? So I would say that for residential waste management programs, the blue box is probably the shining star. And it has been since the early 1980s. Ontario and Canada was one of the first jurisdictions in the world to adopt a formal residential recycling program. And since the early 2000s, the Gubok has recycled approximately 60% of all residential printed paper packaging that's put out onto the market. Hmm. So those are all the great sides of the story. Uh, unfortunately, what we're observing is that over the past decade, the Blue Box system is kind of no longer compatible with the types of packaging that are being put out onto the market. Can you give me some examples of that? Sure. So if you, if you look at your blue bin today and compare it to what it looked like 10 or 15 years ago, you have fundamentally different mix of materials. So, you know, in the early 2000s, you might have a lot more newsprint, magazines, you know, even telephone books. It was made up of a lot more printed paper and the plastics and the metals that you found in it were relatively simple. You had water bottles, you had detergent bottles, and you had cans. And so when we look at the infrastructure for managing recyclables, it was all designed around these materials. Fast forward to now, and increasingly what we're having is lightweight multi-laminate, so made up of multiple plastics, materials that physically cannot be recycled in our existing mechanical recycling system. And I can't hmm. emphasize that point enough. Just because you put it in the bin and just because the city says they accept it, does not overcome the technical challenges of mechanical recycling. So a lot of the materials that were being asked to put in the blue bin ultimately get screened and landfilled. And so uh, my long-winded way of, say, of, uh, of answering your question of like, you know, how, how effective is it? Um, for every one ton of blue box material that residents put in their bin, 30% of it is thrown out as residue. So we're not doing the greatest job of capturing the recyclables that we're telling people to put in the recycling. How might the transition to producer responsibility help with this in a perfect world? Uh, is it to incentivize those producers to use that complex packaging less to go with simple stuff that they know that they can take back and get to recycling? In theory, that is the case. But we have kind of some conflicting priorities and objectives. So the whole idea behind EPR 
is that it will encourage design for the environment. Because there's a financial disincentive to use materials that have low levels of recyclability, they'll ultimately opt for more recyclable packaging. Another kind of premise of EPR is that with a producer-controlled system, they will develop and innovate and find new technologies and markets for these difficult to recycle materials. Because you know what, if they want to make them, then perhaps that they should invest in the end markets and technologies to fully utilize it at its end of life. So these are what it should be doing in uh, theory. Right. In practice, we actually notice the exact opposite result. And there's a couple of reasons why. So I mentioned how our blue box uh, or the composition of our blue box has changed fundamentally over the past 10 to 15 years. EPR in Ontario was in place, a partial form of EPR, but producers despite facing a financial disincentive to use these lightweight composite materials, embraced them. And they embraced them because it actually achieved the very first R in the three R hierarchy, reduce, reuse, recycle. It's not just a catchy phrase, it's the order in which we're supposed to do things. Hmm. And so producers looked at the financial penalty of selecting less recyclable materials, but looked at the potential cost savings of you know, using far less packaging, increasing logistical efficiencies, increasing shelf life. And they said, you know what? I'm going to eat that cost and continue to utilize and proliferate this lightweight composite materials. And so once again, while the theory of EPR makes a lot of sense, uh, conceptually, in practice, you don't often get the results that that is intended or expected. If they're going to be responsible for picking up, let's say, whatever is in the blue bins, what makes them care how much of that ends up in recycling and how much of it ends up in the landfill as long as they pick it up the way they're supposed to? So that's where legislation comes into play. And so uh, under uh, both Ontario's EPR legislation and what's being proposed in other provinces or implemented in places like BC, producers must hit targets for both overall recycling rates of individual materials as well as recycled content for the types of products they produce. So the idea is that, you know, if you set a firm target, producers who are will or away will find a way to get there. Hmm. But just because you legislate something doesn't overcome the technical challenges or economic barriers of making that transition. So a lot of producers are being faced with, you know, once again, targets, but whether they meet those targets uh, or, or exceed those targets remains to be seen. And my personal inclination is that the, the technology, infrastructure, and economic systems are not presently in place that will allow for increased recyclability of these lightweight materials or increased recycled content of these lightweight materials. What do we know so far about how Ontario's transition to full EPR is going? That seems like it's going to be the biggest test, right? And from everything I've seen, there have been uh, complaints about a lack of transparency. You know, Ontario's transition has kind of been a long time in the making. And so we implemented a form of partial EPR in 2002. In 2012, the province actually signified their intention to transition to 100% EPR model. And then the better part of the next decade was kind of working out and debating what this system will look like. And so, you know, in the past two years, Ontario finally landed on this 100% producer transition. It was supposed to usher in kind of a new age for Ontario's recycling system because it expands the list of materials that are included. It expands the number of sectors that are covered, which are all great things, once again, in theory. But the practice that we've observed is that the administrative complexity of coordinating so many players and actors to figure out, okay, how much waste is being generated? How much waste is being recovered? And what does it cost? The data simply isn't there to accurately quantify the size and scale and scope of the problem. Mm -hmm. And the fundamental underpinnings of EPR are kind of based on having that data. You're telling a producer, this is your bill. But you can't tell them how much they put out into the market or how much of it they recovered. A lot of people don't realize that recycling rate numbers are not measured, they're modeled. Hmm. We actually have very poor data surrounding quantities of waste that are being generated into the market and recovered from both the residential and the commercial sector. And so with EPR legislation, the legislation was drafted in absence of having that data in hand. And so now we're kind of in a muddle because we don't know whether the estimates we're coming up with in terms of costs, 
or the way we assign those costs are valid. And there's a lot of stakeholders who are saying, no, I'm paying too much, or others who are saying they're not paying enough. And finally, on the on the topic of transparency, I know I'm throwing kind of a lot of stuff at you. There is, and forgive me for the crass term, an almost incestuous relationship between the IFO uh, in Ontario, which is called Circular Materials. They're the primary industry pro- uh, service provider in Ontario's transition to full EPR. That's the group of the producers together. Precisely. And their relationship with GFL, who is a waste service provider. So Circular Materials and GFL kind of teamed up to form this IFO for Ontario. And it's good in terms of size and scale. They represent a tremendous percentage of the producers. And obviously, GFL is a major service provider. But if one of the principles of the system is that producers are going to choose the lowest cost service provider and it's going to be market-based competition and not rely just on municipal contracts, then you have GFL having kind of a conflict of interest. They are operating or, or have significant influence on how the system is being run, but they're also a competitor within that said system. Hmm. And the entire circular materials taking ownership of this, they have not publicly released detailed data regarding kind of what the costs are, what materials are being generated and produced. Previously in Ontario, under Waste Diversion Ontario and uh, RIPRA, which is the Resource Productivity Recovery Authority, it's a very long acronym, <laughs> they used to publish annual reports with very detailed information regarding the quantities of recyclables that were collected by which municipality, what recycling rates, what were the costs. And now none of that information is being provided. So uh, while the transition was heralded as being kind of, once again, an evolutionary step in Ontario's recycling system, it also came with significant drawbacks that we actually don't know how well this is working. And based on anecdotal rumblings, it's not working too well. Calvin, it sounds like you're telling me that entrusting commercial brands to clean up their own messes is problematic. I think it can be. Um, There are many other systems where EPR is successfully implemented. Give us some examples of those so I don't get too cynical here. Sure. So for things like mattresses or white goods, white goods are like your refrigerators or your appliances. Right. It's much easier to have a take back system operated by producers because unlike packaging, which has like, you know, 23 different types of material categories, you have a fairly consistent material stream. Uh, It's being managed in all relatively the same ways by the same downstream processors. Hmm. And so it's much easier for them to say, okay, this is the fee for disposing and managing. It's normally charged to the consumer when they make the purchase. And then they have their own take back systems and their own recovery systems in place. Right. I would actually argue that EPR has been enormously successful for every material category other than printed paper and packaging, precisely for the reason that there's just too much heterogeneity within the waste stream. It's the way you manage an aluminum can is completely and fundamentally different than the way you would manage a newsprint. And yet it's all going into the same facility and we have to figure out a way to assign costs and divvy responsibility. Mm -hmm. And so uh, I think EPR shows tremendous promise, but in Ontario's situation, and I would say uh, across Canada and even the United States, people are grossly underestimating the complexity and data requirements of creating a successful EPR system. And so essentially we've made promises without knowing whether we can get there or whether we know we have the infrastructure and operational processes in place to make things happen. Is it because our packaging has evolved so rapidly and proliferated so greatly that the blue bin system in general is just outdated or at least inefficient and maybe something needs to change there? Like, is this inevitable whether or not companies or governments were responsible for it? So my personal answer is yes. And I think the biggest problem we have is a fixation on recycling and using the blue box as the primary vehicle to manage these materials. For as long as we focus on recycling as the primary objective of a waste management system, A, we're completely missing the fact that reduction and reuse are ultimately better for the environment and more sustainable. But we also have to realize that just because you can recycle something doesn't mean you should. And You know, the cost of Ontario's blue box system have ballooned. They've tripled since 2002 in excess of $300 million. And so we have a situation where the blue box of today is just not equipped to manage the changing nature of packaging. 
by all available data, it doesn't look like producers are doing an about face and going back to say cardboard and some of the heavier materials that were more conventionally recyclable. And so, you know, to paraphrase Einstein, you know, to keep on doing the same thing and expecting a different result is a definition of insanity. So you mm-hmm. can tell the producers to, to, to pay the bill. All that will happen is that producers will pass those costs onto consumers. But unless you address the core issue of, can I take this material and I turn it into something else? And does somebody want to buy that something else from me? Then we don't solve the recycling problem. And the only way to do that is to kind of explore other options beyond mechanical recycling, such as chemical recycling or advanced recycling. But the province has been pretty clear that those are not options that are presently on the table. Is there anything on the table that would change this? Or are the only things that could really revolutionize this stuff that it's clear we won't consider? Like, what would you advocate for if if you had the power? So kind of to reiterate on the previous comment I made, we, we need to do away with recycling being our primary goal. And I know that's actually extraordinarily hard for Canadians because we have a love affair with recycling. I've been bought into this since grade school, Calvin. Exactly. We've been inundated with the messaging. We've bought into the system and it makes us feel good. And what we really should be focusing on, once again, is waste reduction and reuse. But more broadly, I think we need to reorient the priorities of a system towards what is the most sustainable. Because right now we have a system that says what will get us the highest recycling rate, but we can't conflate recycling with sustainability. Sustainability has three dimensions. It's economic, environmental, and social. And so if you were just to look at the blue box of today and say, well, costs are tripling, but recycling rates are going down, well, that's clearly not economical and it's not particularly environmental. So I would say that policy should look at sustainable outcomes and realize that, you know, in some instances, it may make sense to landfill something. In other instances, it may make sense to recycle or we should focus on reuse in certain scenarios. But I guess the point I'm trying to make is that there's not a one size fits all solution for the problems that we're facing in our system today. And I think that all of the decisions we make should be through that sustainability lens. Is there an environmental benefit? Is it economically tenable? And are there unintended social consequences from this choice? One of the most neglected topics in EPR is the impact on consumers and how that in in turn impacts social justice and equity. Mm -hmm. So when we talk about producers taking over control of a $300 million system, does anybody really think they're going to internalize those costs? No, the most likely scenario is they pass those costs on to consumers and those manifest as increased prices at the store for you and I when we buy our goods. Hmm. Some research that we've done has shown that this potential cost increase can range anywhere from 3 to 6% for grocery items. And when we think about the amount of pressure we're under in terms of inflation and rising costs, 3 to 6% can be the difference between somebody having a meal and somebody going hungry. Hmm. And so I think that In conversations surrounding the blue box, it's not as simple as let's keep something out of a landfill or let's recycle our bottles. We have to be thinking about whatever system we're putting in place. Is there an unintended impact on those that are vulnerable or marginalized? And those conversations have been completely neglected by both the provincial and federal government. Calvin, thank you for explaining this. I'm fascinated with this world. It's great to get a look uh, inside it. Thank you so much for having me. It was an absolute pleasure. Calvin Lacken co-investigator of the Waste Wiki Project at York University. That was The Big Story. For more, head to thebigstorypodcast.ca. And of course, if you like this show, you might like our new show coming out very soon. It's called In This Economy. You can find a link to the feed in our show notes. You can subscribe or follow now, and you'll start getting episodes on November 2nd, one a week, once the show debuts. I hope you'll check it out. The Big Story, of course... It's still daily, still free, still everywhere you get your podcasts. And we are still looking for story ideas or feedback from listeners. Three ways to do that. The first, find us on Twitter at the Big Story FPN, or email us, hello at TheBigStoryPodcast.ca and let us know what you'd like us to cover or what you think. Or call us and leave a voicemail. Just chat for a while and we'll listen. That number is 416-935-5935. Thanks for listening. I'm Jordan Heath-Rawlings. We'll talk tomorrow.